Eeks 281, lecture 16, Trees ADT and Searching, Spring 2020. We've got ourselves a nice idyllic picture of some trees here. Get us started on a peaceful Wednesday morning. Trees are everywhere, not just because we live in Ann Arbor. But this whole concept of the way that information gets arranged hierarchically just really fits with the way that humans process information. So we get a lot of context for trees. Here's an example of how we can take a mathematical expression and express it as a tree. Right? We use these trees to capture these common properties and come up with all kind of really cool analysis and algorithms that can then be done based on the tree structure and that kind of translates from different information areas as long as we can get the information in a tree based structure. Here we see a simple arithmetic expression that has our operators as internal nodes and our operands as leaf nodes. So all of the values that we would be doing work on our leaf nodes and all the uh, tools we'd be doing work with our internal nodes. So today we're going to be talking about how these things get built and used, some concrete realizations, ways to implement these things, and then we're going to describe properties of the algorithms involved. I know that we've seen some of this already in 280, but we're going to try to extend that a little bit the next couple of days I'll be talking about trees. There's two kinds of trees. Uh, we start with a simple tree. One thing that's important to note is that a tree is really a graph. It's a particular type of graph and we are sh we should be aware that all trees are graphs but not all graphs are trees because a tree has to be acyclic meaning there's no cycles. There's no any, there's not any two points that can be connected by more than one route. That's acyclic. We can also consider the fact that everything in a tree has to be connected to the tree. That's not always true in a graph. We can have subsections of a graph. We think of roadways, for instance, in the state of Michigan. There's a number of large islands in Michigan that have roads on them. They're part of the road system in Michigan, but there are certain places you can't drive to or from to get to them. So um, that's what a graph can do. On the, on the other hand, everything has to be reachable within a tree. In a simple tree, we don't really think of them as having uh, a direction, so we consider them undirected. We'll be looking at more rooted trees, which is a simple tree where you've picked one node and said, all things flow outward from here. All the edges are directed away from that root node, as we call it. And then that's how we build uh, most of our common trees here. And CS trees have this fun property that they grow downwards instead of growing upwards. Real trees grow upwards. Well, I guess real trees grow both directions. They've got roots and leaves. But any node could really be the root in a tree in terms of the general definition of a tree. We'll start out with a bunch of terminology. We've got to get a lot of that covered just to make this discussion easier to handle. We've been through quite a bit of this before. We have messed around with some trees even already in 281 this semester. So we'll be starting with looking at this terminology. We've got the root, of course, that's the topmost vertex in the tree. Everything grows down from there got some relationships, parent and child. That's two nodes that are correct, d directly connected with the one that's higher up in the tree being the parent and the one that's lower being the child. We use trees to help us describe the way that our family structure works. And so then we can also use some of those family structure definitions to help us talk about trees. So siblings then are also children of the same parent, just like in real life. In descendants and ancestors, this is something that shows this above and below relationship. So a descendant is going to be below 
some ancestor, and an ancestor obviously is going to be higher up the tree, a predecessor or successor, you can think of those as. But the key thing about the descendant ancestor relationship is one that you can also pick up from your own family. So you can think of a parent, obviously, as an ancestor or a grandparent or a great grandparent. These are roles that are typically ancestral. Things that are not an ancestor would be an uncle or an aunt, right? The reason they're not ancestral is because in order to reach an uncle, the uncle would be the sibling of one of your parents. So you would have to go up to the parent level, up again to the grandparent level, and then back down to get to a sibling of your parent to find. So the ancestor-descendant relationship can only sort of travel one direction on the tree. You can go up the tree and find an ancestor, or you can go down the tree and find a descendant. That's why you can start at a grandparent and get to a grandchild. And you can start at a grandparent and get to an uncle of the grandchild. But that is because the grandparent is the ancestor of both of those. And both of them are descendants of the grandparent. I guess I think of my aunts and uncles as my elders, but they're not technically my ancestors. Even though not all uncles and aunts are actually older than their nephews and nieces. More terminology. We've already talked about internal and external nodes. I mentioned them on a previous slide, but that's because we've also talked about them in class already. So an external node, that's a node with no children. An internal node, of course, is one that does have children, one or more. An ordered tree is one where we have a linear ordering for the children of each node, so there's some relationship in the way that the siblings are structured. And then a binary tree is an ordered tree in which every node has at most two children. Zero, one, or two children is fine in a binary tree. <clears throat> Trees are these wonderfully recursive structures. That's what partly makes them so maddening, is it's often hard to think recursively. But that's the way it is. We've got our recursive trees. We'll come up with some recursive definitions. Then we'll start to see how those recursive definitions directly support our recursive algorithms that we use so often with trees. Most of the time, you can get everything you want out of proper recursion with a tree here. As we look at our first set of definitions here, depth, height, those are the two that are for sort of looking at metrics, the way that the tree is sized. It's recursive because the tree is recursive, so they both have to start with a base case, and we keep them similar, right? The depth of a tree, which is if you start at the root and measure how far down you are from the root, right? When that's empty, it's got a depth zero, and the height of a tree is when we start at some external node and see how far up we can go the ancestral chain. Both of those, when the tree is empty, have uh, a value of zero. Depth empty, height empty, zero. Then we can recurse from there and say that the depth of some node in a non-empty tree is just the depth of its parent plus one. Pretty simple there. That gets us our recursion all the way back because we see that depth of node here is defined in terms of depth. So there's the recursion. Without this thing, we're not going to be able to make this ever stop. So we've got depth of node equals depth of parent plus one. We get all the way up to the root, which has no parent, which has an empty parent tree, if you think about the root in that way. We can see that the height of the, sorry, the depth of the root would be the depth of its parent, which is no parent, zero plus one. Height is different in that it's measured from the bottom up, and you can look at two siblings, and two siblings will always have the same depth, but they can have different heights. Because as we look at the height, we measure that from the descendants or the children or the subtrees of a particular node. So our recursive definition there is the height of any given node is the maximum height of all of its children plus one. So in that way, you can see how uh, one sibling that has no children as a leaf node would have a height of one. However, its next sibling with a single descendant would now have a height of two. And so they would be related in the depth manner, direct siblings, but they can have different heights. That's a little bit complicated as we work our way from 
down to up in height and up to down in depth. So it's easy to remember that. It's just like trees in the real life grow from the ground up. That's how high they are, their height. And then if you've ever been in water, it's kind of important how deep it is. <laughs> you like to stay near the top because depth is measured from the surface down. In the end, the maximum height and maximum depth of any given tree must be the same. And that's where we can sort of associate these two things together. So given that set of terminology, here is a tree that we can play around with those definitions. We know where the root is. Let's see the root right here at A. All things flow down from there. We've got some leaf nodes. These are nodes with no children. We can see them at D, E, G, H, I, J, and K. Those are my leaf nodes. My internal nodes are the nodes with children. So that means C is internal, B is internal, F is internal. And of course, since it's got children, the root is also an internal node. And then if you check it out, you can see that every node is either internal or external. So there's nothing that's left out there. The maximum depth, how do I find that? I start from the root and work my way down as far as I can. Depth of one, depth of two, depth of three, depth of four. I've got a maximum depth of four there as I try to find a subtree. There's a lot of subtrees. Because it's a recursive structure, any subsection of this is a subtree, right? So I could take this thing rooted at F and call that a subtree. Uh, I could take this subtree here rooted at B, or C is a subtree as well. Even D, which looks like just a single node, that's a subtree, a subtree of size one, of height one, of depth one, um, max height, max depth, sorry. Um, so there's one way we can look at subtrees. And then the last question, is this a binary tree? Remember that a binary tree is one where every internal node is limited to no more than two children. And so we see A with uh, three makes this not binary, as well as F having three makes this not a binary tree. All right. These answers all fill themselves out. And there we can see that. So this is not a binary tree. We've worked with complete binary trees already. This is how we made our heap representation in contiguous memory. We had to do it with a complete tree. So in a complete binary tree, we say that's a binary tree with some depth D where all of the depths below, sorry, all the depths above the deepest one. So if the tree is of depth D, all the depths from one to D minus one are completely full. Maximum number of nodes possible. And then if I've got additional nodes in the D level, they have to be the children that are filled in from the leftmost external nodes, right? The, the leftmost nodes in, in level D minus one, I should say. So all the internal nodes on the level D minus one work our way from left to right. That's what a complete binary tree is. And that one's pretty straightforward. If you think about it, we use the binary tree and that's just sort of arbitrary. We like the way that twos work out for us. But if you wanted to have a complete tree where every node had four children or every node had 10 children, you could do that. You would just have something that looked like root followed by its four children, followed by the four children of, oops, that's not a four. We followed by the four children of the leftmost child, followed by the four children of this child, and so on. So I'm sort of drawing them distinctly so you can see them. But if this was just one contiguous chunk of memory, you could see that it's pretty easy to make a complete tree of any order. And all I have to do is a simple set of math. I, I divide by two to find out how I move, divide or multiply by two to move up and down in a complete binary tree. 
But if you use something of high order, you can multiply by or divide by four to figure out where I should get a parent child relationship or ancestor descendant relationship in even a complete uh, quaternary tree. So we've seen this uh, with the array in implementation with the root at index one. We use index one because it makes it conceptually easier. Um, obviously our storage is going to start at index zero so you've got to come up with some way to get around that. That was one of the challenges in converting uh, our slide material into a, an, a functional binary heap in project two. So we understand this. If we uh, do this one based math with the root at one, then I can say a left child of any node is just two times its index. And the right child is two times the parent index plus one. In a general situation, I can skip some indices, but this could be pretty prohibitive for sparse trees. You can imagine a tree that kind of looks like this here with just five nodes in it and everybody goes left. If I'm going to put that into a complete representation, I'm going to have to have uh, at least 16 spaces here with my root there and then my left child there, root, there's a left child, and its left child, and then its left child, and so on. So that's uh, what it would look like if I were to sort of do this stick-based tree. So we can see here it's prohibitive for sparse based trees. The other key with this too is, is when we do it as a complete tree, like we did for the heap, then we don't have to worry about these spaces, right? I don't have to worry about nodes that aren't represented. If I'm going to do an array-based implementation of just a general tree that doesn't have to be forced complete, then I also have to have something trailing that's going to tell me which one of these values are actually valid. Because in contiguous memory, obviously, there's always bits there, right? It's silicon. So there's going to be bits there. Um, to know whether or not we should use the bits, though, we would need some sort of traveling set of Booleans or something that allowed us to know that this particular set of memory is actually valid. So um, that's one thing to note about being able to use complete, or sorry, to being able to use array-based implementations of binary or other level trees. So we already played around with this. This one is pretty straightforward as we look at insertion of keys in best and worst case. When we're doing this with an array, I've got best case constant time. There's room right where I find it. Worst case, I start at the top and have to travel all the way to the end of the container before I find an empty space. Removing a key in the worst case, if I'm trying to find something by key with a binary tree, if I don't have any other rules about how information is stored in my binary tree, I just have to look at every node. So that's why my worst case here, removal, is linear. Finding a parent, of course, we can do that in constant time, divide the index by two, we're there. Finding a child, I can multiply by two, or add one for the next child as well. Multiply by two and add one. Space in the best case is one node, one space. It's linear. In the worst case, much like the example on the previous slide when I drew that stick-based tree, I can see that the worst case space in an array-based tree implementation would be, in this case, big O, two to the N, right? So I'm talking about a binary tree. That's why the, the base is two. If I was to go with a higher order tree, I just need to change the base. So I talked about an example of uh, sort of a, an array-based implementation of a tree that had four children per node. Then that would be a worst case space of big O, four to the N. Pretty painful. And in terms of how to deal with these array-based implementations, it becomes very difficult to do this if I'm uh, allowing the nodes to have different numbers of children, right? If, if, if some nodes could have five children and other nodes could have 12 children, it gets really complicated in trying to put that into an array. Then it's really a lot simpler to do something with some other container or with some connected memory. In our connected memory here, we've got this pointer-based tree implementation. This is a nice, very simple, templated node, and I can build a tree with enough of these. We said that the tree was recursive, and that since the tree is made out of nodes, it shouldn't be surprising 
that the definition of a node is even recursive. We see here that struct node is defined in terms of node, node pointers, but we definitely can't say what a node is without knowing that it includes node pointers. To figure out what a node pointer is, though, we need to know what a node is. And if you ask me that, I'm going to tell you that a node has node pointers in it. And this goes on and on and on because it's recursive. However, the distinction is, in the end, I can have a node pointer point to nothing. I can stop the recursion, right? So you can't create a node with a node inside of it. You can have node pointers because node pointers can terminate. But if a node had nodes inside of it, we would be unbounded in our recursion and things would go horribly wrong. So this is just simply templated. I've got a key that holds my datum and that's all we need. This one is a binary tree. So I've got left and right children. We can move down a tree really easily just by taking some node and activating its left or right pointers if they're not null. So that's how it's easy to move down. It's not so great to move up. It's in fact impossible to move up physically a tree. So if you do need to find something out about an ancestor of a particular node, the way to do that is to hold on to the node you're trying to find the ancestor of, then start at the root and keep testing your way down until you find it. So um, that's why we say it's efficient because I can get to constant time to move down a tree in a pointer-based one. But to just to find the parent in a pointer-based tree, I could have to start at the root and search every other node before I found the node that was pointing to the node whose parent I was trying to discover. So not much changes here. We've got the bolded differences. Insert is uh, best case, worst case, constant time, and linear. If uh, I've got plenty of room at the top of the tree, I just insert something at the root, it's done in constant time. If I've got a stick like the one I drew previously and I want to put something in that needs to go in the left, I would go left, 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 left for every one of those items and stick it in there. So that's my worst case insertion is linear. Removal, just like uh, the previous situation, finding is the problem, right? It's not hard to remove a node in a connected tree. It's pretty simple. It's finding it that could cost you a lot of time there. So I can remove it in constant time, but finding it costs me the linear time, and so that's added to the total cost. Finding the parent I mentioned earlier in a connected structure means just start at the root and keep looking at lefts and rights until one of those lefts and rights has the given node as its child, and then you found the parent. So that's linear. Child, of course, follow pointer constant time. Space here has some improvement because we never have anything we don't need. As in, I don't need any extra empty nodes. So I only have the nodes I need. Keeps my best case and worst case space at big O of N. There's a little bit more overhead in terms of the pointers themselves. So that's something to note that the uh, worst case linear still has two pointers for every node. And our best case linear has two pointers for every node. Here is a version of a binary tree node with a parent pointer. And hopefully you don't have too much uh, PTSD from working on your pairing heap. But this is how we got the pairing heap done. We had to have some way to refer previous or parent because we needed to do some extra manipulations that would have been far too challenging to keep those at just recursive only. So we added that third pointer. It's not very common though. Most of your other tree work, unless it's a special structure like a pairing heap, you're always gonna be able to get by with just left and right pointers. And we can take any tree and turn it into a binary tree. And if you think about that, you knew this already because at its heart, the pairing heap is a binary tree. Every node's important connections are children and sibling. So every one of those nodes has two pointers that are important. The parent or previous pointer in the pairing heap was good for letting us do the rest of the work that we needed to do. But in the pairing heap, we saw that siblings 
were some right base pointer that kept things in the same generation. And then if we wanted to go down a generation, that's what we would use our sort of child pointer for. So if you look at those as child and sibling pointers in your pairing heap, you could also just re rename those to left and right pointers. And so this little piece of uh, definition here is going to show you how you could take any tree and convert it into a binary tree. So I like to do that with this tree right here. It's a little dirty, so let's uh, clean that up. Right, so if I take this tree and convert it into a binary tree, right, let's read what that said there. It said, for all of the siblings, I take the first sibling and make that the left child, and then the remaining siblings from V2 to VK become a chain of right children. So I'm going to go left to get to a new child, and right to get to the siblings. And then, because it's recursive, I just keep recursing. So this tree on the right would look something like A with a left for its first sibling, that's B, and then a chain of rights for all of the rest of A's children, right? Now I've got room to give us our next level below B, which is first sibling E as I move to the right, I stay in the same generation, and I just look at other siblings. So um, C has two siblings as well, G and H, or two children, B, and to the right for H. And lastly, I just need to get in my final generation here, and you can see that I can get down to I on the right of F, J, and K. So there is a binary tree that can be used to represent all of the exact same relationships in this not so binary tree, right? See, every time I go left, I get to a new generation. And every time I go right, I move across siblings. Like I said, just like pairing heap. So this shouldn't be that challenging. This is just a very generic description of how to convert any tree into a binary tree. Once I've got uh, trees, I want to talk about looking at the items in a tree. So we call this tree traversal. I'm going to use tree traversal as a systematic way to process every node in a tree. That's why I do a traversal. And that processing could be uh, for a search. It could be for some output or anything like that. So we've got a few of them. We're going to talk about four particular tree traversals, and those are the most common ones. These first three are recursive. And then the last one, we'll see some hints of project one. In a pre-order traversal, I've got this recursive visitation. All three of these recursive ones, pre-order, in-order, and post-order. That's what they're called. And that all just has to refer to when do we visit or when do we process the node in particular. In a pre-order tree, I'm going to process the node first. In a post-order tree, I'm going to process the node last. And then in order really only has a really good description in a binary tree. Because in a binary tree, I can process the left child of a node before I process the node itself. And then process the right child. Right. So if I don't have a binary tree, in order is a lot harder to deal with. Right. If I've got a ternary tree where I've got every node has three children, in order is less clear. Should in order happen after the first left child or should in order happen after the second left child? So pre-order and post-order work generically for any type of tree. And in order is more focused on binary trees. In all of these cases, I'm going to be recursively visiting subtrees of a node. And to keep things organized, I'm always going to, in every single case, go from left to right. So in a pre-order, I visit the node. It always happens before the subtrees. Then I visit the left subtree followed by the right subtree and recurse. In order, I'm going to recursively visit the left subtree, process the node, then recursively visit the right subtree. Post order, as I mentioned earlier, 
we're going to visit the node last. So because left always comes before right, I'm going to recursively visit the left subtree, then recursively visit the right subtree, and then finally I visit the node. So those are my three common recursive tree traversals. Almost all of the work that we do in trees gets done by the majority of them. The last one we have that's very common is a level order traversal. And this is just like working your way down the family tree. Start with the oldest, then process all of the people in the next generation, then move down a generation and pr process all of their descendants, move down another generation, process all of their descendants. So um, I said we had some shadows of Project 1 in this one, because in order for me to do this level order traversal, I'm going to have to use a Q. I said recursion earlier when I talked about pre-order, in-order, and post-order. And so when I recurse, I'm always making these function calls. Function calls get put onto a stack. So there's stack involved with pre-order, post-order, and in-order. To get level order done, I'm going to use a queue. So we saw that in P1 when the captain or first mate were working in stack mode. They would first investigate their current location, move to the next, all of the locations that were one step away, then all the locations that were two steps away, and then all the locations that were three steps away. And that's exactly what a level order traversal is. Here are some non pseudocode versions of pre order, in order, and post order traversals. And they look really simple, but. They're actually functional code here. With the except sort of visit function external to do the work, these recursive functions will actually behave just as expected from the previous slide. So here is our all important base case. We're talking about these recursive functions. I harp on this every time I mention recursive functions. I gotta talk about needing a base case. I get all the way to final exams and grade students handwritten code that have recursive functions in them and don't have base cases. So don't forget that base. Don't forget that base. It's all about that base. All right, so I see this base case here in lines 2, 14, and 8. If the node I'm looking at is a null pointer, I'm done. That's the end of it. That's what stops me. Otherwise, I'm going to process that node. And in pre-order, that means visit the node first and then go recursively into its left and right subtrees. In post order, I'm going to recursively go into the left and right, followed by visiting the node, and then in order, as I mentioned, as well with binary trees, because I need to be able to say I've got some left and right, and then the visitation is right there in between them. All right. So here's my summary. Well, let's talk about one other thing, though. Let's back that up. In order is pretty good. We like the in order because it's got a name that makes a lot of sense. In order traversal of a binary search tree gives us data that's in order. Oh, I know. There's so many puns, right? But no, uh, this one is pretty straightforward. If I've got a binary search tree, and that's, that's an ordered tree, remember, we know that the siblings in a binary search tree the left sibling is always going to be less than the right sibling. So if I've got data in a binary search tree and I do an in-order traversal, what I get out of it is a nice ordered set of data. So let's see if we can't um, take some summary on these and then we'll try to sort of do simple implementations of them and make sure we've got a good feel for it. We talked about a bunch of definitions. We talked about simple trees. We talked about um, height, depth, max height, max depth, parent, child, ancestor, descendant. All these things are what get us together now. Then we talked about some tree traversals. We talked about pre order, in order, and post order. I said they all use a stack. And then I talked about level order. I said that uses a queue. One thing that's pretty important to note, too, is you'll also see some other terms bandied about when you're talking about trees, something like depth first search, which we just call that DFS for short, and breadth first search, 
BFS for short. So Brett first search, level order, Q, those things are all synonymous. Stack and depth first search are synonymous, and they are done in multiple different ways depending on when I actually process. But pre-order, in-order, post-order are all depth first searches, and we call them depth first searches because they're going to get to the bottom before they work their way across, right? Even in a sort of post-order version, we go left first, then left again as a recursion happens, then left again as a recursion happens, then left again. So we're going to get all the way to the bottom before we process the nodes that move across to the right. So that's why we call them depth first search. And in breadth first search, we're going to, just like in a complete tree, we're going to search every row before we go on to the next row. So that's why we call it breadth first. We work our way across before we go down. All right. So... Here is my simple tree. We're going to try to apply these four traversals and see what we get out of them. So in a pre-order tree, sorry, in a pre-order traversal of this tree, remember, we process the node first, and then we recurse into its left subtree. Once I get there, I'm going to process this node and recurse into its left subtree. I'm going to process this node and recurse into its left subtree, which is empty. So now that it's empty, I can process its right subtree, also empty. Then I can consider this entire left subtree of 1 as having been processed. So now I can process 1's right subtree, which is, of course, empty. So now all of the node, uh, sorry, all of the subtree rooted at 1 has been processed, which allows me to then process the right subtree of 0, right, which gets me at 3. So I'll get there first in pre-order and process the node itself then go to its left subtree and I end up with the working my way back out of the rest of the remaining null pointers. Four has left and right null pointers. Three has a right null pointer. And then after that, we're completely done. So given this tree, I can say that my pre-order traversal looks like zero, one, two, three, four. In order, how does that work? In order, remember, we're going to go left first before we process nodes. So when we enter at 0, we don't process 0, we go left. And we don't process 1, we go left. And we don't process 2, we go left. But left is a null pointer there at 2, so then I can process 2. 2 gets processed, and then I can go right. Null pointer's over there, so I'm pretty much done at that level. Once I've done the left subtree of 1, now I can process 1, so that gets processed there, and then I can move on to write the 1's right subtree. It's empty, so I consider myself done. Now all of 0's left subtree are done, so I can process 0 before I move to 0's right subtree. I go there, I hit the 3, but I don't process the 3 because 3 has a left, so I move to 3's left subtree and process the 4 there because the 4 has no children. No left subtree. Then I can process 4, move to 4's right subtree, empty, and I can call 4 done. Now that 3's left subtree is done, I can process 3 itself. And you see that the only thing happens after that is we realize that 3's right subtree is a null pointer. Okay, we are not updating video, it says here. So, all right, let's go see what stream's happening here. It says my stream is in excellent health. We've got some technical difficulties of unknown origin. Let's try disconnecting the iPad and who knows.
restart one server or another and we will get there eventually. You think so? All right, uh, we've got the beach ball of death going on here. That's a All right. Alternate tools must be applied here. Enough work, anything can be done. All right. Sorry about the, the the glitches there. I don't know what happened. Wireless technology and all of our folly. All right. So uh, I guess this particular slide lagged out. I was talking my way through it. Let's see if we can't uh, restart it. All right. So in my pre-order traversal. Right? I'm going to start at zero. And pre-order always processes a node before it works on subtree. So I'll start out with a zero there and work my way left. Right? And in pre-order traversal, I'm going to process before I go left again. So I get one, then I get two. And these things have all been processed as I work my way down the tree. Then I get back up and I can go to zero's right subtree. And that gives me a check at three and a check at four. And that's what my pre-order traversal looks like. In order traversal, I can go into in order and say, I'm not going to process a node before I process its left subtree. So I'll go left from zero and I can't process one because it has a left subtree. So the first node that I process is a, a leaf node that has no left subtree here. So in order is going to get me to processing two first. Now once two is processed, I can go to two's right, empty. I can go back and process one. One's left subtree is processed, so I can process one. Then I go to one's right subtree, empty. Now all of zero's left subtree is processed, so I can process the zero. All right, moving from there, I go left, can't process three because three has a left subtree. I'll go left. Because four is empty, then I can process four, followed by three, and I'm done. So that's what an in-order traversal looks like. A post-order traversal, I'm going to start by going left again, and I won't process the node itself until I've gone left and gone right from the node. So I start out at zero, go left, go left, and I find that I can't go any further. Then I try to go right, can't go any further. Now I can process this node, which gives me a two there and then I can work my way back up. I've gone left from one and process everything. I go right, it's empty. Now I can process one. So post order looks like that. Then after that, I've processed all of zero's left. I can't process zero until I process its right. I get to three, but three has a left, so I'll go there first. Four having no children left or right allows me to process it. So there's four processed. Once four is processed, I can go to process three's right, empty, now process three. And finally, since both one, sorry, both zeros left and right subtrees are completely processed, now I can process zero itself. All right, there we go. Level order is pretty straightforward. I'm going to work my way from the root down moving left to right as I go into a new level. So level order starts out with zero because I put that into some queue. And then as I pop the zero off, I put zero's children in there. 
one, and three, and that's the order that they come out in. And every time I process something new, I say I process one, I'll put two into the queue, but since three is already there, two comes out after three. And then finally, when I got to four, uh, it looks something like that. All right, so slides are stuck. I do not know what to say about this. All right, there it is. It's updated. So those are my four traversals. Go back and check the uh, algorithms, and you should be able to follow along with that. This is a great place to say, how would I be tested about this on an exam? How can I prove that I know what a pre-order traversal looks like? How would I be able to prove what an in-order traversal looks like? How would I prove that I know this? Here's a tree. Which one of these things are the in-order traversal? Here's a tree. Which one is a post-order traversal? So there's some simple stuff as you get started. You can start working your way to more complicated question uh, questions that are based on showing that you can know this information. One thing that's important to notice here is I had this pre-order traversal, and you see that the root shows up there, the first thing. In a post-order traversal, it also makes sense that because I have to process the entire left tree and sub right subtrees, I can't process the root before anything else, right? Before I process everything else. So there I have a perfect distribution there, and you can see that in my in-order traversal, my root is exactly in the middle, right? Well, that depends. Depends on the structure of my tree. In this case, because the size of the left subtree and the right subtrees are the same, then an in-order traversal definitely puts the root in the middle. It's always going to be sort of relative to those sizes. So if I have three times as many nodes in the left subtree, I'm going to see three times as many nodes before I see the root and then the last uh, quarter in the right subtree if I do an in-order traversal. So you can use that information to sort of look at a traversal and see what you think about it just by looking at the root. And then, even better, because this is a recursive data structure, you can think of any node as the root of some subtree. So here, if I think of one as the root of a subtree, then you would expect that I would always see one before two in a pre-order traversal, and I'd always see one after two in a post-order traversal, and then the in-order traversal, because one is the parent and two is the left subtree, you can see that the left subtree two would come before the one again as well. So you can use that in this next exercise. Right, there's our official answer slide. Looks like that. I believe I nailed all those answers. I'm going with it. All right, here is the question at hand. Given one tree, two traversals, find the third traversal. So there is a unique tree who has a pre-order traversal, looks like 7, 3, 6, 9, 8, 13, 27. The in-order traversal looks like 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 13, 27. The question is, can you draw the tree? How do we pull that off? Well, we know from our previous slide that in a pre-order traversal, the root is always first. So right away, we've got our root taken care of for us. Looks like that. And not my favorite color for slides. So let's pull something up a little brighter. There we go, seven. So there's my root. My pre-order traversal demands that that first node is going to be my root. All right, that's good. How about the next 
one in the pre-order traversal. In a pre-order traversal, because I process the node first and then I process the left child and the right child, it means that three could be here, the left child of seven, or it could also be there, the right child of seven. I wouldn't be able to determine that from the pre-order traversal alone. Then I've got to rely on my in-order traversal. So what do we know about an in-order traversal? We know that all of the items to the left of a particular node show up in the in-order traversal before that node. And all of the items in the right subtree of a node show up in the in-order traversal after that node. So from there, I can see right away that 3 has to be before 7. 3 is before 7, so it has to be in 7's left subtree. So I can draw out a 3 there. All right. So there's two nodes inserted. Where does the 6 belong? Well, in terms of a pre-order tree now, where could 6 be? 6 could be processed after 3, which would be its left subtree, or it could be processed after 3, which could also be its right subtree. It could be processed after 3, which is also being processed after 7, so it could be in 7's right tree. So all three of those open sort of edges could be pointing to 6. I'm going to once again need this in-order traversal to do my tie break. So if I think of traversal with 6 as it relates to 7, I know since 6 it comes before 7 in the in-order traversal, it must be in 7's left subtree. So 7 is to the left. That rules out this location for the 6, right? It can't be 7's right subtree. It could, however, be 3's left or right child. But if I look at the in-order traversal, we remember that... Uh, sorry, in the pre-order traversal, we remember that any node has its children after it, right? The root of anything here. So I know that three would be the root of the subtree with six in it, but the side that it goes into is going to be determined from this in-order traversal, right? Things that come after a node in the in-order traversal must be in their right subtrees. So then six goes here. I've got a null pointer over there, and I think I'm going to keep moving forward. So six is inserted. I know that six comes after nine. Sorry. I know that 9's inserted. I know that 9 comes after 6. So where could it go? It could go to 6's left. It could go to 6's right. And it could also go to 7's right. So I've got some options there. I need to go view the in-order traversal to get some tie breaks. Looking at the in-order traversal, I see that 9 shows up after 7. So right away, I know that 9 cannot be in... Anywhere in 7's left subtree. So 9 then has to be here. That's it. There's only one place to put it. Right? After this... Got reports of buffering and YouTube Studio says excellent connection. No comments, no problems, no nothing. Stream is healthy since 11 a.m. All right. Inserting eight. Where does eight go? How do we know 6 is right? How do we know 6 is right? Because we see that 6 shows up here in the in-order traversal after 3. It's after 3, so with in-order traversals, remember that we process the left, then the node, then the right. So if 6 shows up after 3, it must be in 3's right subtree. All right. Good enough. So 6 has got to be over there. And then as we, we inserted the 9, we figured out that the 9 shows up after 7. So in the in-order traversal, 9 has to be in 7's right subtree. So that pretty much locks down all of these two things. So I can think of uh, 6 as terminal that way. <coughs> all right, inserting 8. 
8 could go to the left or right of 9 and still show up properly in this pre-order traversal. But if I look at the tree that is rooted at 9, think of this as the root, things before this in the in-order traversal have to be in the left subtree, so that means that 8 can only be there. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that puts 8 in place. How about 13? Well, 13 is going to be after 9. So 9 is the root of the tree that 13 has to be in. So we can see the pre-order traversal has 13 coming after it. So it could be somewhere in terms of the pre-order traversal, anywhere after the 8. I could go left or right from 8, or I could go right on 9. So to, to get the tie break there, I can go see where does 13 show up. 13 in in order shows up after the 9 which means it has to be in 9's right subtree. So 13 then is here. And lastly, I've got 27. 27 could be left or right of 13, and the tie break from the in order says it's going to be in 13's right subtree, so 27 looks there. And I've got my uh, null pointers, and my final answer looks like that. So this is a great exercise, something... Uh, similar to this or related to this. You, so some question about how to work with your traversals, how to define them, how to discover how they relate to a particular tree. That's the way that you should be thinking about this because hopefully this whole concept of in-order, pre-order, post-order traversal is not complicated and you've got that well. Then as I mentioned, the only thing that's important to you as a professional student is how do I deliver the fact that I've got that knowledge on an exam. What kind of questions are gonna be given to me to show that I can tell them I know this? All right, how about writing a function to do a level order traversal? Hint, project one, hint, Q. Right, So I'm going to process the root node and then process each one of its children in turn. Then process each one of its grandchildren from left to right and so on and so on. So I said project one. Right, We looked at any one of those trees. We can see that our level order is going to start with a base case. This has still got to say if I've got an empty tree, uh, I'm going to be done, right? Here's my cue. I'm going to seed the container, then repeat, right? As soon as I put the root node in there, I'm going to repeat as long as it's not empty. And while it's not empty, I'm going to take the thing out. And if it has any children, I'm going to push the children, right? So there you see me processing it in line nine. I'm just in this case, printing out the node value. Then I'm going to if it has a left child, push a left child. If it has a right child, push a right child. And that gets all of the next generation into the queue. And they all end up after everyone in the current generation. And this then is the heart of project one, where this container was sort of interchangeable depending on how the captain or first mate were behaving. But all we did was get something out of the container, do something with it, then add anything around that. In the uh, pirate ship, we were looking northeast, south, and west. Here in a binary tree, we just have left and right. But it's the same concept. Pull out some value, add anything around it, and then move on. Same thing with a pairing heap. So hopefully you get that as a general algorithmic method for doing these traversals and searches. <clears throat> What is search, of course? Retrieval of some piece of information from this large volume of data. Usually we want to be able to take some small key and get a large piece of information. So just having the key, I don't want to go search for the key because if I've got the key, there's no sense searching for it. Usually we want the key to unlock something larger, right? So we don't want to have to have all the information to find the information. We just want a small piece. <clears throat> We know that um, in arrays and linked lists, we can always get a search done in linear time. So that's the worst case. Any, anything that we're going to be discussing in terms of search, 
has got to be no worse than linear time. And if we can get better, then we definitely are going to be happy about that. So even a hash table has got this worst case big O of n. So when we're trying to do something with search and we're looking for some optimal efficiency, we're looking for something better than linear time. Enter the symbol table, abstract data type. We've got this that we've already messed around with the symbol table from dictionaries. When we looked at hashing, we looked at the symbol table where we said we were gonna able to do some simple operations. Insert, search, and remove. That's great. Sometimes we would wanna be able to sort the symbol table. We said that was fairly difficult with a hash table. But we're gonna look at sort of the symbol table at a, at a one step higher, one step more abstract, just as a thing that we can do. So we can sort symbol tables, it's just not efficient to do that with a hash table. So what if we had a symbol table that we did want to sort, we might implement that with something other than hashing. Selecting the kth largest item, also not a skill that hash tables have, but it might not necessarily be ruled out as something you want, right? You could want to do that with a symbol table. And joining tables, we're always going to want to construct, test, event, be, and destroy, copy, etc. But there's my basic symbol table definition. We've seen that already. Now, since we're talking about trees, I'm going to do this with a binary search tree. The keys in the binary search tree are going to have this additional property. We talked about a binary tree as having two children only. We talked about ancestors, descendants, all of those things hold. When we talk about binary search tree, we're going to apply one more property. We call this the binary search tree property. We say that the key of any node is always going to be greater than all of the keys in its left subtree and less than or equal to all of the keys in its right subtree. So that's pretty simple. And we pick this particular arrangement because it supports less, right? If I want to go and find some value, if it's less than what I'm looking for, I'm going to go left. That's when the keys of any that's when the key of any node is always greater than the things to its left. How about the things to its right? Everything to its right here, it says are going to be greater than or equal to. But in terms of how we get that done in STL and coding, is if it's not less it's right. So we still are blessed by only having to write one particular comparator. If I've got something that behaves like less, I know where to find things in the right. And if it's not less, it must be in the left. That handles greater than and equal to with one operator. That's great. So the essential property of BST is that insert and search are equally easy, right? They're easy to implement and they're pretty straightforward, right? So the binary search tree property says, I've got to be able to take a couple of trees. Here's two valid binary search trees, right? If you look at the root, you can see everything to the left of the roots or any roots of subtrees. Anything to the left is less than the value I'm looking at. I've got one tie here. And because greater than or equal to is not less than, you can see that ties have to be in right subtrees. Even that same tie here, five and five, See that this 5 is in the right subtree of that 5 right there. And then if you look again closely, you see this is actually the same two trees in terms of data. The exact same six data items are in both trees. It's just that they were inserted in a different order, and the binary search tree property has made the trees shaped differently. But if I was to do the look for those nodes, I would find them. And since these are BSTs, I've got everything I need there. So my concrete implementation of a binary search tree node is just like the earlier binary tree nodes we looked at. There's nothing distinctive about a binary tree node versus a binary search tree node. It's just how I apply things as I use those nodes. So there's nothing there that's different. In this case, I've just sort of removed the template so that I don't have to look at that as an extra line. But you see that two line two still has this key defined in terms of some templated type makes my code a little shorter for slides but it's still necessary for compiling <clears throat> so here's our exercise write the output for in order pre-order and post-order traversals of this bst we're going to kind of breeze through this we got to catch up some time here technical difficulties have slowed us down earlier i said the great part about an in order traversal is if i've got an in order traversal 
in a binary search tree, the data that I get out comes out in order because I would start at six and not be able to process it until I get to a leftmost node, right? So there, my first process is a two, followed by a couple of fives, followed by six, followed by seven and eight. And I'm gonna call that my in-order traversal. In my pre-order traversal, right, I always process a node before, this, before it's children. So six is up, then I go left, I go five, and let's put an underline here. And so when I do that, I'm gonna look at that as the underlined five, and then, uh, which one am I doing here? Uh, Pre-order, then left, then right. Pre-order, then left, gives me two, then right, five. Now I can move across, which gives me seven, and then eight. So that is pre-order. And finally, post-order, I'm gonna process the uh, root node last, or the node itself last, I'm gonna go, left left before i hit the bottom i start out with a two then i'm going to go right and then i can put the uh, five followed by the underlined five now i'm going to go right and from seven i still have to go left and right so i'm going to process eight first followed by seven and finally my root at the end of a post order traversal so there's that one in fast uh fast fashion giveaway slide did this already can you think of an easy method to sort using a binary search tree yep it's in order traversal that's it sorting a binary search tree is just insert all the value sorting with a binary search tree is I just insert the values into the BST and then in order traversal them out so the in order traversal we know that that's gonna go through every node once all of my traversals go through every node once. So you can think of traversal as being a big O N. This is a linear behavior, whether it's pre-order, in-order, post-order, or level order. Those are all linear in terms of their traversal uh, time complexity. So why then do I have a linear sort by using a binary search tree? Because the insertion is not constant. If I could in insert into a binary search tree in constant time, then I could sort in linear time and all of existence would be a different thing. So we don't have that. We've got the BST, right? BST insertion is going to be obviously best case constant time, worst case linear time. We saw that. And then average case, we get this nice log n. So that's why we end up with these n insertions on average log n and log n for the insertions and then it's just linear for the traversal and you've got yourself a sort with a binary search tree. How do we find a key in a binary search tree? It's pretty straightforward. We know that if we're looking at something and it's greater than what we're looking for, then I need to go left because what I'm looking for is less than what I'm looking at. That's when I go left. Oh, I've got a feeling that I might have lost my, uh, I think I'm noticing what's happening here in this machine. My slides are still with me. Can I write on this slide? I think I figured it out. And we're back. Look at that. Before we even got lost, we're back. <coughs> All right, so. We're trying to write this function here, tree search. Takes in a node pointer, that's gonna be the root, takes in the value that we're looking for, and then returns a pointer to the thing that we found. That's what we're looking for in terms of tree search the function. All right, that's yours to write. If you're off site, pause. Write this function. If you're on site, mm, I hope you wrote the function. All right. And there's tree search. Tree search is just like binary search. Right? In a binary search, we know that if the thing we're looking for is not it, is not what we're looking at, then we go to the left. We look in the left half. And we can do that in a binary search tree just by following one edge. So this is a simple tree search function that's going to keep going and is going to return 
some pointer to the thing, right? If the thing we're looking for isn't there, we're going to get to the bottom of the tree somewhere and say, I haven't found what I'm looking for. All I can see now is a null pointer. It's a dead end. All right, I didn't find it. Return that dead end. So this function is always going to return a pointer to the node that you are looking for. Or if no node exists with that value, then it's going to return the null pointer. All right, so we've got a nice while loop. As long as uh, I've got something to look at, because remember, this is going to be recursive. There's my base case is right locked up right in there. If what I'm looking at is a null pointer, then just quit and return that null pointer. But if it's not a null pointer, then if the thing that I'm looking for is not what I'm looking at, I'm going to go left or right accordingly. If what I'm looking for is less than what I'm looking at, I go left. Otherwise, I go right. And eventually, this is tree search. It finds it. All right, here we see it a little bit more uh, condensed. And this tree search version is actually recursive. You see here, I've got tree search function that calls tree search. And it returns a call to tree search. So this is tail recursive. So this is perfectly equivalent to that previous version that uses the while loop. Um, it works, right? I've got my base case. If it's a null pointer, or if I found the thing, return this thing that I'm looking at. Return a null pointer if it's empty. Return the value if I found it. Otherwise, <clears throat> if what I'm looking for is less than what I'm looking at, go left. And lastly, go right. So search ends up in the BST looking like this trace of a downward path starting at the root. I'm going to find the thing, and my complexity then is completely tied up in the height of my tree. The worst case complexity is the height of the tree. Best case, I can always find this thing somewhere or anywhere. I can find it in one shot when I get lucky. But the worst case is going to be the height of the tree. So we think of our tree algorithms. Um, ultimately, they are in terms of the number of items in the tree. But for the most part, because of the structure, we think that the height of the tree is more directly related to the algorithm. right? So that's why we see when we've got worst case linear structured binary trees, we've got linear worst case algorithms on binary trees. So here's our example of search for 9. Starting at the root, I say it's less than what I'm looking at, go left. It's not less than what I'm looking at, go right. Not less than 7, go right. It's less than 13, go left. And there is me finding 9. All right. There's an ink check. All right. I got ink checks going on here. Search complexity is big O of H, where H is the height of the tree, the maximum height of the tree. Average case, we see that that uh, is a nice, really dense, complete tree. A complete tree is as, as short as a tree can get in terms of total max depth. And the worst case is going to be this stick. We call them stick trees because it just keeps going and going and going. So I've got some big O, N, and worst case complexity. Average case complexity, when it's fairly balanced, we say that's big O log N. <clears throat> how about insert? How do we insert? Well, it's like search. I'm looking for the place to write something. So I just perform like I would normally perform with a search until I find the null pointer. That null pointer is the thing that I want to be pointing to my newly inserted item. So I'll start at the root, trace my way downwards. As soon as I get to a null pointer, that's where I append this new node. So looking at a physical example, we can see that to insert 10, I just search for 10. 10 is less than 15, go left. 10 is not less than 6, go right. Is not less than 7, go right. 10 is less than 13, go left. 10 is not less than 9, go right. Oh, no pointer. Insert 10. All right. So that's how insertion works. It's worth noting here that sometimes I can put duplicates in trees. Depends on your data and the particular problem at hand. So when I'm inserting 
duplicates, then I do have to worry about is equal to. Like, if I'm not if I'm not using duplicates, then it's pretty easy. I can always just go left for less than and right for greater than. But when I've got equal in there, I've got to be able to tie that up here in the slides. I've mentioned that we use less than to the left and greater than or equal to to the right. So that's why you'll find them here in the slides. But given your own definition, you could do that your own way if you wanted to. Um, the reason why we do it this way is because it works well with less and works well with the STL. Since everything already has a, this assumption of a less comparator existing, if comparison is to be done, then we would just use less than. So here's how insert works. It's recursive. I've got tree insert defined in line one in terms of tree insert called in line five or line seven. And it's the last thing that happens, so it's tail recursive, single stack frame, constant amount of memory overhead, and then our time complexity is just going to be maximum height of the tree. So, as I go to insert this, though, I see I've got something tricky going on up here. Look at this first parameter. <clears throat> Node pointer by reference x. Right. This means that I'm passing in a pointer to this function, but if I change what this value is pointing at, I will be changing it in the calling function. So the, the function that called tree insert will have passed me the root, and if I need to, I should be able to modify the root in the calling, fun in the calling function from the called function. So since a pointer is just a number, it's just a number. It's a memory address. Go there, find thing. All a pointer is is a number. In reality, is no different than an integer. If I pass an integer to some function by value, that function gets its own copy. Anything it does to that integer is not represented in the calling function. So the called function needs to have a reference to it so that it can be updated in the calling function. Right? So the called function, in this case, gets a pointer by reference. So if I change what that pointer is pointing at, it's changed in the calling function. So that's why we've got this parameter type that we don't see too often. Pointer by reference x. So now if I show up in this function and x is a null pointer, I just create a new node and the insertion is done. That is, of course, my best case. If I've got something there, I'm just going to keep going until I get to that null pointer because I... I said insertion was find where this belongs in, in search terms, and when it doesn't show up there, you get this null pointer, that's where you insert it. <clears throat> so this kind of just does that just by using the base case. As long as x is not a null pointer, it just keeps recursing, right? If x is not null pointer, it's either going to recurse from line 4, uh, sorry, in line 5 here, or it's going to recurse in line 7 to get down there. Eventually we get to base case, that's where we insert. All right, so here's our exercise. One of these things where you say, this is a great chance for me to show what I know about tree insertion. So start with an empty tree, insert these keys in this order, draw the tree, then write some new order that can take those same keys and insert them into some worst case tree, right? We want to generate a worst case tree. Same nodes, different order. So there are your three questions with the last one being, now that we've made a worst case tree, how many different ways can I make a worst case tree? All right, so there's my tree, right? I started out, I inserted the 12. <clears throat> Five is less than 12, so I go left, find the null pointer, put it there. Uh, 18 is not less than 12, so I go right, find an null pointer, there's my insertion point. Two comes along. It is less than 12, less than 5, so it shows up there. 9, less than 12, not less than 5, so 9 goes right there. 15, not less than 12, must be in the right subtree. It is less than 18, so that's where 15 belongs. 19 is not less than 12, not less than 18, there's where it goes. 17, where does 17 belong? 17, not less than 12, less than 18, not less than 15. I go right, that's where 17 is. And lastly, 13 is 
not less than 12, go, go right. Less than 18, go left. Less than 15, go left. And there's where I find 13. Right? So that's what this particular data set inserted in this order into a binary search tree looks like. The very first couple of binary search trees we saw with those six items were the same data inserted in different orders, so it gave me a different shape tree. The second question on this exercise was to find a worst case ordering for these things, or sort of, a, sort of a, an ordering for these things that gave me a worst case binary search tree, right? And one of those, I always get this in class, is just sort the data and sort them that way. And sure enough, if I sort them in increasing order, I'll get something like two here, which is less than five, which is also less than nine, which is less than 12, less than 13. And you can continue on that way, giving us a worst case stick tree. The final question was, how many different ways can I create a worst case tree? Well, sorting got it done. What if I sorted them in descending order? Then I would start with 19, go left for 18, go left for 17, go left for 15, and yep, sorting them in reverse order would also work. So the question was, how many of them are there? Two. Or is there more? The stick here is basically some version of a tree where no node has any siblings. That's what a stick tree is in our loose definition of stick tree. So in that case, I can have a stick tree that looks like this and then jogs left at the very end, or it could come up a little bit higher, or it could come and then jog like that. Any number of stick trees could be defined. Then the question is, how many can there actually be defined? <clears throat> That's my dramatic pause while you figure out how many there are. Well, it turns out at any point, if I don't have siblings, then what I need to do is choose the largest or the smallest remaining nodes. Right? So then I end up with... Something that looks like uh, two to the n minus one different sticks. I can take the first node. That's got to be the smallest node. Yes, two to the n minus one. That's right, because the last choice, I don't really have a choice. There's one thing left. So at the very beginning, I can make one of two choices, the smallest thing or the largest thing. Next step, I can make the smallest or largest remaining. Next step, smallest or largest remaining. So each one of these places, I've got these two choices I can make until finally there's one node left and I don't have any choice there. I have to accept that one there. So it ends up with uh, two to the n minus one different trees. But then if I want to figure out which insertion order I'm going to go for these in, it's even more complicated than that. But uh, Note that there are a lot of different unique trees. That's why it's important. is Because in reality, if the only sticks that we ever had to deal with was just a straight left or a straight right stick, in terms of the total number of trees, my worst case happens almost never. Right? I got a large tree with 50,000 items in it, and you say there's only two worst case trees, then you're not really worried about worst case happening. It won't happen that often. But because those 50,000 items end up giving me something like uh, two to the n minus one different ways I can come up with bad trees, then you see, well, there's a lot of bad trees. So um, keep that in mind. Worst case is a real thing. That's why we are trying to avoid worst case in our trees when possible. All right, let's go to this complexity here. The complexity of insert and most of our other tree functions, we said that depends on the height of the tree. In an average case, we got a balanced tree my height looks something like log n. Balanced means, you know, there's about as many items to the left of you as there are to the right of you. That's what, that's what balance is. We'll talk about a more uh, official definition of balanced when we work on this again tomorrow. But in my worst case, I've got this stick. I've got this linear height, big O of my h is n, 
big O of N because it's big O of H there. Um, in the average case, though, if I've got random data, sort of like I randomly gathered the data or randomly generated the data and then inserted it, I'm going to get a tree that's pretty well balanced. And so that's why trees, when they deal with real world, real data, are, are usually pretty good because they give you something that's close to that log n for both the insert and the search, and life is good. All right, how about finding some stuff here? Write a function to find the node with the smallest key. Now this is easy. If I'm looking at some node and it has a left child, I know that in a binary search tree, that left child is less than the node I'm looking at. You just recurse upon that. If there's a left child, go there. It's got to be less than what I'm looking at. If there's a left child, go there. It's got to be less than what I'm looking at. Until I can't go left anymore and I have then found the tree min. There it is. If x is equal to null pointer, then return null pointer. That's my base case. This is a recursive algorithm. But if it's not a null pointer, then as long as it has a left child, go left. Eventually, when I can't go left anymore, I'm just going to return that thing. That thing with no left child is the tree min. Average case complexity with an average case tree is, of course, height log n. My average case complexity log n, worst case complexity, I've got a stick and everything goes left. So I got a big O of n there. How about removal? We're going to figure out how to get this removal done. <clears throat> and that's going to pretty much wrap us for the day here. So removal is kind of interesting because I have this BST property that has to be maintained. Remember, everything to the left of a node has to be less than that node. And everything to the right of that node has to be not less than the node. So I can't just take anything out because when I pull some node out, I've got to retain my BST property. So it's pretty easy to remove a node if it has no children. As a leaf node, you snip off the leaf, it's good to go. That's trivial. If a node has no left child, that one's fairly easy too. If with no left child, that means the node only has its right child. And the things in the right child are not less than that, you can replace that node with its entire right subtree. So that's pretty easy. I can just snip that off, right? So um, here's my uh, simple case. With no left child, all I have to do is replace Z with that right child. So this is a CLRS um, graphic style. And you can see here that I've got a node with a pointer to null, right? This is a terminating pointer. And then this R has these sort of ellipsis style edges, meaning there's some number of items in the subtrees. We don't know, don't care, right? We know, however, that R might or might not have children, but it might have dozens or hundreds or millions of children, and this still holds. So if I'm pointing at some node Z with no left child, you can see that just removing Z from the problem keeps Q pointing at R and I've got everything, no loss of information, no breaking of the BST property, and we're easy. <clears throat> it's also easy when I'm going the other way. If I've got no right child, it's similar. It's just a mirror image. I can replace Z with that left child. My BST property is protected. No data is lost. Now, what about the hard case? When Z has a left and a right child, and I want to take that node out, I've got to put something in Z's place. But Z was pointing to two things. When Z is only pointing to one thing, it's easy to replace Z. But when Z is pointing to two things, I have to figure out how to replace this one new empty pointer with two things and keep them without losing any information and without breaking my BST property. So I use this key observation here. When I combine these trees of both of the sub, make a combination of the, both of these subtrees, Everything in the left-hand subtree, because it's less than the node, and because everything in the right-hand subtree is greater than the node, I can say that everything in the left-hand subtree is less than everything in the right-hand subtree. Right? So what I'm going to do is take the smallest node in the right-hand subtree. Right? Because even the smallest node in the right-hand subtree is larger than all of the things 
in the left-hand subtree, right? That's this definition we have right here. First one, everything in the left-hand subtree is less than everything in the right-hand subtree. So even the smallest thing in the right-hand subtree is still here greater than things in the left-hand subtree. <clears throat> if I move that node up to the top, right? If I move that smallest right-hand side node up to replace the node that I'm deleting, I can protect my binary search tree property. How does that work? Well, the good news about the smallest left-hand node, how do we find the smallest left-hand node? Sorry, the smallest right-hand node? I'm going to go right once and then keep going left until I can't go left anymore. Right? So I know that the smallest right-hand side node has no left child. That means if I'm going to take that smallest right-hand side node out of the right-hand side, it's going to be easy because at most, that smallest right-hand side node can only have a right child. And we know that deleting a node with only one child is easy. You promote the child and you take the node out. <clears throat> so I'm going to take the smallest right-hand side node out of the right-hand side and replace the deleted node with that because it's from the right-hand side. It's still larger than everything in the left-hand side. And because it was the smallest right-hand side node, it can be to the left of everything else in the right-hand side. Here it is in pictures. Right? I've got to remove V. That's my goal here. I've got this left-hand sort of teal triangle. got this right-hand purple triangle, and I've got this other isolated smallest node in the right-hand side, right? So this one is kind of identified specially. But these triangles represent some subtree height of indeterminate nature, right? So if I take the smallest thing in the right-hand side, it's still bigger than all of these. So it can be the node with left-hand side still as its left child or left subtree. And since it's larger than everything in the right-hand side... <clears throat> I know that I can still go from the node to the right and find all of those other right-hand side elements. So that's how this is going to be done. And we give this node a particular name. We call this node the right, sorry, the in-order successor. I go right once and go left as many times as I can. And I find what's called the in-order successor. All right, <clears throat> so in order successor is exactly what it sounds like. If I was doing an in order traversal, what would be the node after me? That's my in order successor. Who comes after me is my successor. So if I'm deleting some V, all I need to find is its in order successor. And I find that by going to the right once and then going left as many times as possible. And there is where the in-order successor comes from. If I can take the in-order successor, replace V with it, I've got a tree that is combined. Both my left and right subtrees from V have been combined, and my BST property has been protected. No loss of data. All right? So, uh, I'll show you the code for it, and this is definitely something that you should check out. Understanding this code is, uh, is kind of important. And it's not straightforward either, because this is a single function remove. It takes me three pieces of code to do it. And I am now fully in charge of all things. I realize I have lost my slide connection. And I have just restored it. All right. Look at that. All right. So this is single function remove. I'm taking this function remove. Right, and this is a recursive function. So I'm gonna call remove here and here when I need to pull things out. So this is a recursive function. This will re remove one particular node. And this is a great illustration of what I said earlier, is unless we're doing something really, really uh, out of the ordinary, there is no need for parent pointers. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take care of removing some item with this recursive function remove. And that's how we do it, right? So I'm passing in a pointer by reference again because I might be modifying the tree. I must be modifying the tree as far as 
the calling function is returned is, is concerned because I'm the called function. I'm going to change that tree back where it was called from. So I'm giving it the value that I want to remove by reference, so I don't have to make copies of it. And then I'm going to go find it and then remove it. So the first thing to do to remove an item is you got to find the item. So that's where I start out with here. I've got a couple of pointers. I'm going to use those later. I've got the node to delete. I'm going to eventually use that to point to the thing I want to cut out. And then I'll use another pointer to find the in-order successor. And I'll do the rest of the work from there. So I'll recursively find the node containing the value I want to remove. If I've got a null pointer, then I'm done. There's my recursion. Get that base case right out of the way. Otherwise, if I'm not talking base case, if what I'm looking for is less than what I'm looking at, I want to go to the left-hand side. I just recurse from there. Otherwise, I'm going to go to the right-hand side and recurse from there. So that's great. And then the last else is what? The last else happens when what I'm looking for is what I'm looking at. So I am now with tree pointing at the thing to be deleted. So this particular call, since tree is pointing at what I'm deleting, it is that node to delete is the thing that's going to be deleted. Tree and node to delete are the same when I've gotten to this else. Page two. Let's get those easy cases out of the way. We said the easy case is when the node that we're deleting has only one child. So uh, the if statement in 14, uh, sorry, in, the if statements in 15 and 19 check just that. If the tree left is a null pointer in 15 or in 19, if the tree right is a null pointer, then we know that that node has at most one child. Turns out if the node has zero children, then tree left is null pointer and we dive right in here. <clears throat> so this first branch of if lines 15 and 16 and 17, they handle if the tree has just a right child, it also handles if the tree has no children. We just delete the node to be deleted, right? That's great. We set tree equal to tree right. We promote its child if it has one. If this is a null pointer, then we set tree equal to null pointer. So this handles whether or not the tree has one child that is uh, right only, it handles no children. And then this handles the, in, in the, the, the else case, if it has just a left child. All right, so there's the easy ones. The last slide is all dedicated to that tricky little in order successor find and then replace, right? So in this case, we have to find the in order successor. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we'll go to the right to get that. Tree right is where the in order successor must be. And then as long as the in order successor has a left, we're just going to keep going left. And so this eventually, by the time I get done with this while loop, in order successor will be pointing at the in order successor. I'm going to use the in order successor to replace the node that I'm trying to delete. So you can see here, I say node to delete's value gets assigned the in order successor's value. That moves it up there. Now all I have to do is remove the in order successor, which is very easy because it's going to recurse back into remove. And we know that the in order successor cannot have a left child. So it's going to end up falling through in here. And then the in order successor gets deleted with this piece of code right here in a next recursive step. After that, deletion has happened. So there's my summary slide, binary search trees, each nodes, each node points to two children, a left and right. And possibly in some outside cases, a parent. I think of my nodes as being ordered. Left is less than the root, which is less than or equal to right. If I've got the duplicates in there. Modifications are pretty easy when I've got an external node. It can be a little bit more complicated inside to make sure that I don't lose data and I don't break the BST property. But we looked at that. And we finally got some general sort of complexity on these things. I said my complexity is always big O of H height of the tree, and on average, that's log n. In the worst case, it's n. All right, that's going to do it for us.